All right, so in chapter five, we're gonna be learning about the gas laws. So there's a bunch of them and a lot of them are very similar to each other. But before that, we need to understand the properties of gases. So we learned about in chapter one, the states of matter. And we're just gonna go really in depth with one of them today. So gases, they, what do we know about them? They're very small molecules. They move very fast. They have the largest degrees of freedom in terms of um, if you're comparing them between liquids and solids. And they move very fast in straight lines. They don't react with one another. They, they're, most of them are inert, the ones we have in our atmosphere. Um, and they, have, they fill any container uniformly. So um, no matter what the container is, let's say if it's the room, eventually my breath, the particles will reach out into the room um, in an equal, in equal uh, distance away. And they are compressible. So this is the key thing with gases that's different than liquids and solids is we're going to be dealing with this other variable called pressure. So pressure is the force that an object puts per unit area. So F divided by A. And for gases, it's really the amount of force it puts on whatever container it's in. That's what the pressure is. So that's what we mean by it exerts pressure on the surroundings. So here's a barometer, which is one of the first pressure measuring devices. And the way it works is you have the atmospheric pressure on mercury is, a, is liquid at room temperature and it responds very well to pressure. So the atmospheric pressure would keep mercury in, some, in, in a container and it would actually push it up a measured barometer, a calibrated barometer to get to a certain level in millimeters. In a normal calibrated barometer, the atmospheric pressure or the atmospheric force that is pushed down on this mercury moves that barometer mercury up to 760 millimeters. That's where we come up with this new measurement called one atmospheric pressure or an ATM. So one of the, the, the um, S, SI unit for, for pressure is the ATM. So the ATM is basically one atmosphere. So one of the atmospheric pressures. Now, if you have two ATMs, you're going to feel really squished. It's kind of when you go down lower in the ocean, when you have more pressure on you, you're going to be increasing your ATMs or increasing the pressure. If you go up to a mountain, you decrease the pressure because you have less air, less atmospheric pressure pushing down on you. So um, for this barometer, one ATM is going to be equal to 760 millimeters Hg. So that's actually the unit. So millimeters of mercury is actually a unit that's derived from this barometer. And another unit they derive from the barometer is really the same thing as millimeters Hg is called tor. So this is also equal to 760 tor. So those are two of the main units. Those are really the three main units that we're going to use in pressure. There is a fourth one that's used a decent amount called pascals. But one ATM is equal to 103,825 pascals. So it's a pretty big number. We're not going to be using it too much. Um, but you may see it. Um, but it's an easier conversion to do. I mean, if they give, they're going to give you that conversion. If they, and they're they going to give you these too. But the 760 is pretty easy to remember. So yeah. So yeah, here's those units right here. So you have one ATM is one atmosphere. And that's 760 MMHG, 760 Tor. Now here's another one called Pascal, which is, we don't, Pascal we can use kind of in the equations, but um, the, the definition of it is a Newton per meter squared. So force, Newton is force divided by area. So um, that's really the definition of it. And that's a Pascal, but, oh, I got it wrong. It was 101,325. So I was close, but basically one ATM is equal to that. Now, um, the definition of pressure, like I mentioned, is the force per unit area. So basically the amount of force that the gas puts on the container, whatever container it's in. So let's do some simple conversions just to get ourselves acquainted with the units. Now, if a pressure is measured at 49 torr, represent it in both atmospheres and pascals. So let's write down our conversions, one ATM, is equal to 760 tor or 760 mmhg, whatever you want to write. And then we have one eight, or then we have 760 tor 
would also be equal to 101,325 pascals. So if we have 49 Tor and we're converting to ATM, we would do one ATM divided by 760 Tor and the Tors would cancel out and you get 49 divided by 760, very small number, point, I would guess 0.9, point, or no, point oh 0.09 something, or point oh, I'd say 0 0.08 something. And it's on the next slide. And then for the other conversion to go to Pascal's, we know that 49 Tor multiplied by the 101,325 Pascal's over 760 Tor, Tors would cancel out and you'd get a big number there. So if you do that math, you would end up with, oh, I was wrong, it's 0 0.064 ATM or 6.4 times 10 to the negative two, and you would have 6.5 times 10 to the third Pascal's. So a basic simple unit conversion there. All right, so let's jump into these gas laws. The first one we're gonna talk about is Boyle's law. So Boyle's law represents the relationship between pressure and volume. And if you remember from last class, we went over the dilution formula. It is very similar to the dilution formula. Every formula that involves an inverse proportionality is basically the same. You have constant or you have variable one times another variable in state one equals variables in state two. And if one of them goes up, the other one has to go down. That's exactly what we saw for dilutions and it's exactly the case for Boyle's law. But we're not relating concentration and volume, we're relating pressure and volume. That's what these P's and V's stand for. And just like in a lot of other equations, you don't have to have the same, you don't have to have the SI unit or a specific standard unit for pressure and volume in this case. As long as both the units of, let's say V1 and V2 or P1 and P2 are the same. So you can have P1 and P2 in Pascal's or ATM, as long as they're both the same. And the same for volume, you could have it in liters or milliliters. So let's take a look at what this means, this Boyle's law. So let's say you have a standard barometer, or this, this whatever, this, this loop of gas, candy cane of, of, of gas. You have this, this gas suspended in this part and you put in some mercury. Okay, so this mercury, based on gravity, is gonna exert a certain pressure on this gas and that it would be the pressure of the gas. If you add more mercury, what's gonna happen? The, the pressure increases on the gas and directly that decreases the volume of the gas. So that's really the act of compressing. That's what Boyle's law represents. If you compress something, you're doing two things at the same time. You're increasing the pressure that is put on it. And at the same time, increasing that pressure decreases its volume. So they both happen instantaneously. So, that's the best way to represent it. And here's some data. Here's some actual data from Boyle's experiments. And he saw that once he increased the pressure, or sorry, decreased the pressure, you would see that the opposite would happen as you increase the pressure, if you increase the pressure. So if you decrease the pressure, you kind of imagine like the best way to represent it is a piston. Is there a piston example here? Uh, later there's pistons, but if you have a piston, and basically what a piston is, is a cylinder with a with gas in the middle. So you have gas inside, and then you have another disc on top of it that is free to float, and it floats by the pressure of the internal gas. So if you put pressure on that piston and you push it down, the gas will get more crowded. It will put more force in the outside container increasing the pressure and at the same time decreasing the volume. But if you do the opposite and decrease that pressure and kind of let off of that piston, what will happen is the volume of it will start to relax and increase. And then if you multiply those two numbers together, almost every single time you end up with a constant, which is whatever P1, V1 is, it equals a constant. That's why you can say at any one of these P1, V1s, let's say it's this state, and you compare it to this state, you get the same number as your P1V or your P times V. That's how he knew that this law is true. Okay, so 
we're going to be talking about this thing called the ideal gas law later. But first, we need to understand what an ideal gas is. So an ideal gas follows the kinetic molecular theory of gases to a T. And this ideal gas is a theoretical thing. There's no such thing as an ideal gas, believe it or not, even though we're going to be learning the ideal gas law. Because something we assume with gases, the main thing we assume is that there is absolutely no attractive forces between the gases, which is false. There's some, there's a little bit, you know, like in physics, assume it's a frictionless, massless pulley and all that stuff, right? So chemistry is the same way. Sometimes we have to make assumptions to make the calculations easier to increase your understanding of it. Um, but actually, we're going to learn towards the end what happens to the equation if it's not ideal. But we'll get to that when we get there. But an ideal gas in general means that they're, they follow all the, all the laws of Boyle's law, Charles's law, Avogadro's law. And there's actually another one here. For some reason, I've never seen a textbook that covers all four. There's Boyle's law, Charles's law, Avogadro's law, and there's another one called Gay-Lussac's law. And they're, they're all comprised into the combined gas law, but there's never a textbook that goes over all four of them before the combined gas law. I, I still don't know why, but they should all come together. But anyway, let's do an example. So let's say you have a, consider a 1.53 liter sample of gaseous SO4 at a pressure of whatever Pascals. If the pressure is changed to 1.5 times 10 to the four Pascals, at a constant temperature, what will be the new volume of the gas? So the idea here is to dissect the question. So ask yourself, what, is it, what, what do we need and what does it give you? So we're using Boyle's law and we're obviously using Boyle's law now because that's the only thing we learned, but it's always important to write down your variables first because if this question was given to you on a test or in the homework after you learned all the laws, it might not be as apparent of which one to use. So the best thing to do is to just, as you're reading it, write down your variables. So, oh, we have a volume, V1, 1.53 liters, gaseous SO4, what, SO2, whatever, pressure. We have a pressure is 5.6 times 10 to the third Pascals. And if the pressure is changed, so we have P2, 1.5 times 10 to the four Pascals, at a constant temperature. Now, the equations that we're gonna learn, some of them are omitting some very important variables, such as temperature, the amount of gas. But if, the, if those variables aren't written in the equation, we could assume they're held constant because it changes everything drastically. If you have the temperature in state one is different than the temperature in state two. Because something we're gonna learn is that if you increase the temperature of gases, it speeds up their molecules. It tends to increase the volume if the pressure is not constant. And it tends to increase the pressure if the volume is not constant or the volume is constant, yeah. So the idea is that you have this third variable lurking around of temperature. And in these equations, you're going to have other variables that are held constant in order for this equation to work. Another one is moles. If, you, if, this, is a, if this is a car tire, right? and state one, you have a certain pressure of the tire and a certain volume of the tire. If you pump more gas into it, you can't use this equation at all because you have more moles of gas into it. So it'll be a completely different scenario. And when we learn about our ideal gas law and our combined gas law, those situations are taken into account where we have additional variables, not just two. So anyway, going back to this problem, we have, we're, we're looking for our new volume, which is V2. And we have all these numbers. So we can put those basically plug and chug into the equation. And we can put 1.53 times V or times P1, which is no, 5.6 times 10 to the third equals P2, which is 1.5 times 10 to the four or times V2. So we can divide by 1.5 times 10 to the fourth. That cancels out. And we divide by 1.5 times 10 to the fourth. And I will make it easier for everybody. This would be the math. So right here. So that's how we would solve for V2. Now you can do these problems the way you like to in physics. So in physics, the best thing to do is to write out your, num your letters first and then find out what you're solving for. In this case, it's V2. And then replace it and plug in your numbers at the end. 
that's fine. I, I didn't, I never did that. Well, in physics I did, but not in chemistry because there's not that many variables. Physics is a lot more usually. Um, but anyway, so that's how you would do that. Um, any questions? The Boyle's law. No, all right, cool. They're all, they're all basically the same. Um, there's another one, we can, we can not to do that. All right, so the next law. The next law is Charles's law. Now, before I continue, I'm sure many of you are thinking, do I have to memorize these laws on a test? Yeah, but there's an easy way to do it. If you remember the two main ones of the combined gas law, which is literally Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Avogadro's law, well, not Avogadro's law. It's Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Gay-Lussac's law, which you don't learn. It's those three combined. That's great. That'll help you in everything. And also the ideal gas law, which is even more important, that will help you in everything. So if you remember those two, you'll be good for all of these because the variables, the extra variables they have, if, you, if the question tells you temperature is held constant, for example, you can just cancel out temperature in both cases. So anyway, Charles's law is the next one. So um, uh, this guy, Charles, found out that the volume of gas at a constant pressure increases linearly with the temperature. All right. This is if the, the, t the pressure is held constant. So here's what he's saying. If you have a piston, and we'll, we'll draw another piston, and you have the gases on the inside. If you increase the temperature with a flame of this piston, of the gas in the piston, and the pressure is held constant, meaning it's going to be at a constant pressure. So what will happen is, if, and meaning if this piston is left to float freely, what will happen is the gas molecules will speed up. Once they speed up, they're going to start to create more pressure. In order to alleviate that pressure and keep the piston at a constant pressure, the free floating piston will start to go up and the volume will start to increase in order to keep the same pressure. So this phenomenon means that the volume and the temperature are now proportional, directly proportional to one another. Meaning if the temperature increases, the volume is going to increase. And the opposite is also true. If the temperature is decreased, meaning the gases become slower and they become closer together and they put less force on the outside container, the, in order to keep the same pressure of the piston, the piston will start to go down and it would decrease the volume. So a decrease in temperature leads to a decrease in volume. So that's Charles's law. So all the gas volumes of all the gases extrapolate to zero at the same temperature. At, yeah, so there's another reason why absolute zero is not possible because the volume of the, of the ideal gas would become zero. And then if it does, that means it doesn't exist, right? So it's mind blown, right? So that's all theoretical. But anyway, um, there is a very important thing with this law. So, and with every law that involves temperature, I'm going to write it down. Temperature. Temp has to be in Kelvin, can you please turn off your microphone? Mute, mute. Thank you. Okay. So temperature has to be in Kelvin. That's important. Because if you have it in Celsius, Celsius is different than Kelvin, obviously. But if you have, let's say, zero degrees Celsius, and, or no, that's not a good example. If you have one degree Celsius and two degrees Celsius, the multiplicity difference between T1 and T2 is multiplied by two, one and two. If you convert those to Kelvin, it's no longer a multiplicity difference of times two. It's now 274 and 275. It's a multiplicity difference of they're about the same. So when you solve for the remaining variables, you'll get completely different answers if you stick with Celsius. So it's very important that you use Kelvin in these. Always use Kelvin. So the, the volumes could be milliliters, liters, gallons, whatever you want to do. But the temperatures have to be in, in Kelvin, or else you won't get the same answer. Okay, so we understand this already. 
All right, so let's do the question example. So we have a sample of gas at 15 Celsius at one ATM, has a volume, so it tells you the pressure, all right? It has a volume of 2.58 liters. What volume will the gas occupy at 38 Celsius at one ATM? All right, so ATM stay the same, you notice that, they're both one. So that means it's a constant pressure. And even if they changed, we can figure it out when we get to the combined gas law. So let's solve things. Um, so V1, so let's say a sample of gas is 15 Celsius. Right off the bat, you have T1. Immediately, I want to convert that to Kelvin. Add 273, you get 290, no, 288. You get 288. Then it has a volume of 2.58 liters. So V1 equals 2.58 liters. What volume will the gas occupy? What volume? That means V2 is going to be our unknown. And our new temperature is going to be 38. So 38 Celsius plus 273. What's that equal to? Want to do math for me, anybody? Or I could just figure it out. 311. Yeah. <laughs> All right, 311. Okay. So who can tell me, is V2 going to be greater or less than V1? Good, why? Good, exactly. So it's gonna be higher than V1 because the temperature is increasing from 288 to 311. That means it's gonna get hotter, there's gonna be more molecular movement, the piston is going to um, expand more if the pressure is held constant. So what we can do is put these into the equation, and you can do that. You could solve for V2 first if you want, and then by multiplying T2 over, so you'd have V2 equals T2 times V1 over T1, or you can put the numbers in first, doesn't matter. So you get this, and then you can put the numbers in, and you get 2.79 liters. So any questions on Charles's law? It doesn't really get more complicated than that for Charles' law. Hmm. All right, moving on. Got it. There's another one. Oh, no, that's Avogadro. Oh, sorry, Avogadro's law. Yes. So, next one, Avogadro's back, right? So, you know Avogadro's number very well. And Avogadro has a lot to do with moles. So, Avogadro also postulated things about moles of gases. And he said that if you keep the pressure and the temperature constant, and you put in more moles of gas, that increases the volume. And everybody was like, oh, that's, that makes sense. Good job, Avogadro. Here's a Nobel Prize. So I think he got a Nobel Prize for that. I made it up, I have no idea if he got a Nobel Prize, but he probably did, that's pretty. You, you would think that's like a, oh, duh, of course that makes sense, based on what we know. But like back then it's like, that's, Pioneering discovery, that's crazy. But anyway, so the piston example we'll use again. You have the piston, you have the gases in the piston. Now you got the piston. So if you keep the temperature constant and you keep the pressure constant, meaning that this, the, the cylinder or the, um, the plate on the piston or the piston itself is on a is not being held at a fixed volume at a fixed position then if you pump in more moles of gas what's going to happen the piston is going to go up and it's going to expand so you have another direct proportionality which is why it's a fraction v1 over n1 equals v2 over n2 you have another direct proportionality between volume and the number of moles so n is number of moles n is not um, mass it's just quantity in moles that's important. And the equation works the same way. So let's do one of these here. So if you have, and they give you the answer, whatever. Right, ignore the answer. So if you have 27.1 grams of argon, occupies a volume of 4.21. So volume one equals 4.21 liters. What volume will, the what volume, that means V2 is unknown, will 1.29 moles, so that means N2, is 1.29 moles, 
of neon occupy at the same temperature and pressure. So you're using two different gases. So you have to figure out the moles of this one. Now, you're using two different gases, but they're all ideal gases, meaning they all act ideally. They're all acting the same, especially when you're dealing with noble gases, they act basically the same. And you can compare their molar volumes to one another, which we, we're going to do later. We're actually going to figure that out for a lot of, a lot. we're going to see that a lot of the gases act the same in ideal behavior. Okay, so argon, what is the molar mass of argon? Argon. It's, what is it, 39.9, so 40. So 27.1 grams divided by 40 equals, oh, this answer's not here, fine. Or the answer's right there, but the numbers aren't here. The math. 27.1 divided by 40, that equals 0 0.68 moles of argon. Okay, so it occupies that volume, so this is gonna be our N1. What volume will 1.29 moles of neon occupy at the same temperature and pressure? So we can put that into the equation. Two point, or sorry, 4.21 liters over N1, which is 0 0.68 equals V2 over 1.29, and we multiply that by 1.29, 2, 4.21 divided by 0.68, times 1.29, and I get 7.99, and what did they get? They got 8.01, 8 ooh, ooh, so different, close enough. I had to manually go through all of your exams, and sometimes Canvas didn't catch a little significant devia a little insignificant deviation like that, so I had to go through and make sure that Canvas didn't screw you guys over for points, so. That took some time. It's all part of the job. All right, so um, anybody have any questions on that one? Again, it's another just plug and chug. Okay, cool. So let's just do, let's see this one. So a cylinder is fitted with a movable piston, okay? Pressure inside the piston, inside the cylinder is PI, and the volume is VI. What is the new pressure in the system when the piston decreases the volume of the cylinder by half. So you have a pressure and a volume. If the pressure, or what is the pressure if the volume decreases by half? So you have piston one, and then you have piston two. Volume's gonna decrease. So what would be the new pressure? Good, C, and people say, good, C, Alex and Isaiah, good job. So, and the reason why is because of Boyle's law. So you have P1, V1, also the answer is right here on the bottom, but you have P1, V1 equals P2, V2. So if the pressure is gonna increase, or I tell you, I, well, if you know, you don't know that yet, but if the volume decreases, this one decreases, that means the pressure to compensate has to increase by the same multiplicity number. So the volume goes down by half, meaning the pressure has to double. So that would be two PI. Cool, all right, so here's the combined gas law. So the combined gas law is a combination of really Charles's law, Boyle's law, and Gay-Lussac's law, which we didn't see. So Boyle's law is here, or I'll just, so I'll do. Boyle's law is right here. Charles's law is right here. And Gay-Lussac's law, which we didn't cover, is right here. Pressure and temperature, if you hold volume constant. So yeah, you can kind of see all of them have an interplay with each other. So now the only thing in this law, now someone can tell me, what's the only thing in this equation, if we had a problem with this, that would be held constant based on the variables we learned. Good, so moles. So yeah, moles would be constant. So moles 
are constant because there, there aren't any moles changing the equation. So that's good. All right, so we can use this equation. Are we, is there any examples that we can use it in? No. Yeah, this one we can use it in. Let's do this. All right, so chlorine, flows in the flames, pressure, temperature. Okay, here we go. We can use it in this one. So we have a sample of diborane gas, a substance that bursts into flames when exposed to air, has a pressure of 345 torr, a temperature of negative 15 Celsius, and a volume of 3.48. If conditions are changed so that the, pressure, the temperature is 36, and the pressure is 468, what will be the new volume? So now you have six variables, you know five of them, plug and chug. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to, sorry, to do that. So I'll give you until 7.03, you three minutes. All right, so let's take a look at this one. We have our variables, so I need you guys help for the calculations, or actually maybe not. So we have our variables. So temperature one is 15. As soon as you see that temperature, you wanna convert it into Kelvin. So you have 15 is now 258. Oh, negative 15, right? Yeah, negative 15, so we should say negative 15. Is now 258. Um, temperature 36 Celsius is 309 Kelvin. Volume one is 3.48 liters. Volume two, you're not sure. Pressure one is 345 torr. Pressure two is 468 torr. And then you're just gonna plug them in. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. And you're gonna get your answer, which is what? What was your answer? 3.07 liters. Can we confirm? Cool. So does that make sense? Let's see. This is kind of a difficult one to look at, but you have the temperatures going up. So you're thinking, all right, the volume is probably going up too. 
the pressure is also going up. So you're thinking, all right, if pressure goes up, that means usually the volume is going down. The temperature is going up by less than, by let's say one point something, 1 1.2, 1.3. The pressure is going up by a little bit more than that, probably 1 1.4, 1.5. So you can, you can say approximately that the pressure is going to have more of an influence on decreasing the pressure. The pressure is going to have more of an influence on decreasing the volume than the temperature increase is. So you can say, all right, if I had to guess, I would say the volume is going to decrease, and that would be correct. So even qualitatively, you can look at these problems and kind of figure out the answer. All right, so next thing is the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law is different than the combined gas law. So on this slide, we saw the combined gas law. On this one, we see the ideal gas law. So this one has different variables. And the best way to represent it is PIVNERT. PV equals NRT, PIVNERT. And in this case, like I said before, the, or as I said before, the units of the variables don't really matter unless it's temperature, then it's always Kelvin. In this case, they do matter. Units are important, I wrote in caps. And the reason why is because you have a new variable here. Well, it's not really a variable. It's, it's actually the opposite of a variable. It's a constant, this thing called R. So R is new. R is what we call the universal gas constant. And it was discovered to make this equation work. That's why all constants were discovered. So R has multiple value, values. There's an R that has MMHG in it. There's an R that has Pascals in it. There's different R's. And if you take thermodynamics, you're going to learn all the different R's. But for this class, we mainly use, well, you might see other ones, but they're all going to be given to you. You mainly see this R. 0 0.08206 liter ATM per Kelvin mole. That's the unit, long unit. So and it's per Kelvin divided by mole. So it's like Kelvin mole should be like parentheses like that. Okay, so this is the unit. Now, let's see if that makes sense. Let's look at the equation as a, as a whole. All right, wait. Uh, Logan, good question. It, will it be memorized? So this one should be memorized. Yes. So, and you're going to be using it a lot in the homework, so it should be it should become commonplace to you. But that's a good question. So, I'd say the most important ones to memorize are the combined gas law, which is the P1 V1 over T1, and then Pivnert. And the units are definitely important to memorize. But the the R constant will be given. So, if you forget the units, you can look at the R constant units, and you can see what units they are. Yes, Logan. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was your question. So, the R will be given. And if you're using a different R in the equation, that'll also be given. So R will be given. Okay. So um, let's try to figure out R from this. So here's what we're going to do. We're not going to put any numbers in, and we're just going to put in the units. So pressure is an ATM, let's say. Volume has to be in liters. N is in moles. R is just R. And Temperature is Kelvin. So if we solve for R, what are we going to get? R equals ATM times liter divided by Kelvin mole. So that's where the units come from. That's why R is that unit. Okay, so now with this, we can solve really any equation with this. So it's kind of like the combined gas law on steroids. We can solve any question with it. I meant to say. So let's do this one. So yeah, this one. Let's let's just see. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So uh, suppose we have a sample of ammonia gas with a volume of seven milliliters. So V1 equals 7.0 milliliters, and a pressure of 1.68 atm. Pressure one equals 1.68 atm. The gas is compressed to a volume of 2.7 milliliters. V2 equals 2.7 milliliters at a constant temperature. So you know that T1 equals T2. 
use the ideal gas law to calculate the final pressure. Now, if I were you on a test and I was asked to calculate the final pressure, I would look at that and be like Boyle's law immediately because it relates P and V directly with no other crap involved. But you can also solve this equation or this question and any other question with the ideal gas law. So what you can do is very similarly like Boyle's law, Charles's law, uh, combined gas law, Avogadro's law is make the state one equal the state two. So you can basically make pivnert one equal pivnert two with the ideal gas law. So if you put pivnert all on one side of the equation, PV plus NRT, you will come up with P1, V1, not P1, P1. P1, V1 over N1, R times T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, R, T2. So you get two piv nerds. Now off the bat, the Rs are going to be the same. Cancel those out. The T1 equals T2 because the question says it's a constant temperature. Our T's cancel out. Suppose we have a sample of ammonia gas. The gas is compressed. Nowhere it says you're adding or removing gas. So the moles are constant. And if you're smart and you deduce this information, well, you're all smart. But if you are good at critical thinking and you deduce this information, you end up with Boyle's law. And then you can solve it like normal. This is 2.7. And then you can just, you end up with P1V1 equals T, or equals P2V2. So yeah, that's pretty cool, right? You can start out with the ideal gas law and get any other law. So yeah, and we can solve this. So I'm not gonna, I'll here's what I'll do. I'll write the 1.68 ATM times volume. Even though you're using PivNerd here, the, can, the constant is canceled out. So you can, you can scratch what I said about has to be in liters, doesn't really have to be anymore. So you seven milliliters equals P2 times 2.7. So you divide this by 2.7, divide this by 2.7, and you get a number. Did I tell you? No, I don't. You get, let's see, 1.68 times 7 divided by 2.7, you get 4.34. No, 4.34. That's going to be in ATM. Okay, and that makes sense because what you're doing is you have a volume of seven, you're compressing it, which means the pressure is going to increase. So it increases by almost twofold as the volume decreases by twofold. Okay, I'll do the equation one more time. So you mean the, the Pivnert equation? Like, like do that deduction again? Yes, okay, so um, so looking at this Pivnert, I'll write, it, I'll write it one more time. Oh, that's not the eraser. N R T1, N2, R T2. Okay, so from the question, suppose we have a sample of ammonia gas with a volume of this and a pressure of this. This question is only talking about the pressure and the volume changes. It's compressed to a volume, meaning the volume changes, and at a constant temperature. So right there, it explicitly says the temperature is constant, so we can cancel out these. R, we know is the same value because it's the ideal gas constant. So we can just cross them out on both sides. And then we know that the number of moles is the same because it never says I'm adding or removing any gas. So that cancels out. Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna move on. Going to what's next? So we know Pivnert already. Got it. Oh, I think that's the same one. Oh no, that's the other one we just solved. 3.07, 3.07. Nice. So you can solve that one. We use the combined gas law for. We can use Pivnert for that also. Okay, here's another example. We're not gonna really go over it because it's the same thing. Okay, so next thing that's important is molar volume. So we'll do like a couple more things and then we can take a, take a five minute break. 
So molar volume. Now, it's a definition that's important to know. So another thing to know. And it says that one mole of any ideal gas at this standard condition, the standard condition is called STP. And that's a term that's going to be thrown around a lot in this chapter, STP. So this STP standardized condition, one mole of gas has the exact volume of 22.42 liters. And I would say for you guys, the only thing to remember is 22.4. 22.4 liters. Don't worry about the 22.42. So it's saying that at these STP conditions, and STP is zero Celsius or 273 Kelvin at one ATM. That's what STP is. So on the test, they might ask you, you have a certain amount of sample at STP. That should automatically tell you, all right, I know the temperature, I know the pressure. And they're not going to give you the definition for STP. So it's important to know what that means. The, the zero degree Celsius or 273 Kelvin and one ATM. So it's telling you that one mole of gas, of any gas, it doesn't matter if it's hydrogen gas, which is very, very small particles, or um, radon gas, which is huge particles. It doesn't matter. They're, since the size of the particle is so small in comparison to the distance between each molecule, you can say that one mole of it at STP is exactly 22.4, independent of the identity of the gas. That's what we mean by these ideal conditions. So, yeah. So that's that. Okay, cool. So that, remember that number, 22.4 for the molar volume. Okay. And you can deduce other equations from this, so from, from PV equals NRT. For example, if you replace N, which is the number of moles, you can replace it with the grams of the gas divided by molar mass, which we know that's how you calculate moles. So in some questions, you might get, you might not, it might not be as straightforward as you have three moles of argon. They might tell you, you have 15 grams of argon. In that case, you'd have to put in, you'd have to figure out the moles before you can put it into PV equals NRT. So you can replace PV equals NRT with the grams of gas over the molar mass, I wouldn't do that. I would just figure it out first and then put that N into the equation. That's just me. And you can use that and deduce another equation that tells that actually figures out the density, that has the density as a component in it. So what you can do is using that substitution, you can see that you have the mass over the volume. So that mass over the volume equals the density of the gas. So using the density of the gas, you can have a modified PV equals an RT equation. Now this one, you could figure it out, but I would say, I'd say this one's better. Or I don't know, it doesn't matter. They're the same equation with the density, but it's just basically modifying PV equals an RT to figure out the density now, and based on the molar mass. So, P equals dirt over molar mass. That's the way to remember it. Or molar mass equals dirt over P, same thing. So remembering one of those would be very helpful um, if you encounter density. Or even if you don't memorize it, you could work backwards and see, okay, what's density? It's um, grams per milliliter, all right? So I have grams and I have milliliter. From grams, I can figure out moles. From milliliter, I can figure out liter. Put those numbers into ideal gas law, good to go. But that takes more work than memorizing this equation. I'm not a fan of memorizing equations, but it's just here for you in case you need it. So you can get around, you can get your get your way without it. Okay, so let's do this as an example. So let's write the equation first. P equals dRT over P, no, over molar mass. I'll write mm. The density of a gas is measured to be 1.5 or measured at. 1.5 ATM and 27 degrees Celsius found to be 1.95 grams per liter. Calculate the molar mass. So we can put those numbers directly into this equation. So 27 Celsius, we're going to add 273 and we're going to get 300, 300 Kelvin. So we can put in the pressure as 1.5. 
The density is 1.95 because we have grams per liter. So it has to be in grams per liter because we know our volume is in liter. And we, so I'm gonna go back. We, we need to know it's in liters because when we replaced N in PV equals NRT, it was grams divided by molar mass. We put that into the equation here and we canceled out the M over V. M in this case is in grams. V in this case is liters. So that means your density, your density unit has to be in grams per liter in order to use this directly. They might give you grams per milliliter. In that case, you'd have to convert. But I'd say if it gets complicated like that, just go back to basics. Find the moles and find, um, or if, you're, if you don't know the moles of the gas, then I guess you'd have to use this. But yeah, but anyway, so you have 1.95 is the density, oh, I'm right here. Uh, yeah, times R, so R is, is not eight, nope. There's, there is another R that's 8.134, or 8.314, but we didn't do that one yet. 8206, times the temperature, temperature is 300, divided by the molar mass. So we don't know the molar mass, we multiply and then divide. So we can multiply molar mass over to the left side, divide by 1.5, do like a cross multiply thing, and we can calculate the molar mass, which would be 32 grams per mole. So now, what gas has 32 grams per mole? What do you think? Good, O2, yes, O2. So yeah, O2. So this gas is most likely gonna be O2. Okay, any questions on that? So it's kind of a curveball with this density, but it's still a valid equation you can use. Dirt over P equals molar mass, or pressure equals dirt over molar mass. Okay, cool. So let's do some questions. What happens to the density of a gas contained in a container fitted with a movable piston if you heat the gas? Now this is to the density. So what happens to the density of the gas? Does the grams per liter stay the same of the gas? Increase or decrease? So the temperature is gonna be heated Anybody online? I don't mean to pressure you guys. Get it? Pressure? Anybody online? So if you heat the gas in a piston, will the density increase or decrease? Well, no, the movable piston, it's a movable piston. So the, piston, the, the pressure will stay the same. So if you heat the gas, what's going to happen? If the piston's moving, that means the pressure will... Or, in order to equilibrate the pressure, the piston will move up. What will that do to the volume? Increase it, right. So if it increases the volume, good. So it decreases the density, right. And oh, Isabella, oh, you guys said it. Angela, Salen, Catalina, and Isabella, good job. So it decreases the density of the gas because that movable piston, when the gas is heated up, it will move the piston up. And that will decrease the volume of the, or sorry, increase the volume of the gas, which will then make it less grams per liter. So it'll spread out the gas. It will dilute the gas, if you will, to a larger volume. Good. So you're holding two balloons, each of, with, each of which is fitted with the same mass of a gas. One balloon is hydrogen, one balloon is helium. So H2 has a molar mass of two. He helium has a molar mass of four. Which of the following statements is true? The balloon filled with hydrogen is twice as large as the balloon filled with helium. The balloon filled with helium is twice as large as the balloon filled with hydrogen. The balloons have equal volume. They're filled with the same mass too. So keep that in mind, they're filled with the same mass. Yes. Yes, the answer is A. So let's take this rationale. 
So if you have the same mass of them, it all depends on, so like I said before, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how big the gas particle is. They all take up the same amount of space because they're so small. It all depends on the amount of moles. So if you have the same mass, let's say you have 100 grams of hydrogen, 100 grams of helium. In that 100 grams, you would have 50 moles of hydrogen gas. You would only have 25 moles of helium gas. So the hydrogen gas wants 50 moles. That's going to be twice as large, meaning twice as many molecules as the helium gas sample. So therefore, it's going to be bigger. Partial pressures, we're going to be back. So everybody get your snacks and join us back at the computer. Okay. So partial pressures, what does this mean? Oh, I should go on the previous slide. So if you have, and in most cases in the world, you're going to have a mixture of gases in a container. And every, every the room that you're in right now is a mixture of gases in a container. You have 80% nitrogen, 20% of oxygen, or about 20%. And then you have like 0.4% of CO2, some argon gas, some helium, some hydrogen, things like that. But basically, if you add up each individual pressure, you get the total atmospheric pressure. So the total atmospheric pressure is comprised of, let's say, if, it, let's say it's, if the total atmospheric pressure is one ATM in our atmosphere right now, then the partial pressure of nitrogen, so we'll put PN2, is going to be 0 0.8, PO2 is going to equal 0 0.2, about, and let's say PCO2 is going to equal 0 0.004, etc. So the idea is that all the partial pressures added up are going to equal the total. And this partial pressure, this is the, the summation, the superposition, whatever you call it, you just add them up. Um, is the same thing is also true for the moles. So if you have the total moles in the sample, it's going to be by adding up the individual moles and the percentages are actually the same. So that's how gases work and we're going to see that. And you can say that if you assume that each gas is a ideal gas, you can say that each one has its own PV equals NRT. You don't have to write that, but you can just, you can just know that. You can write it if you want, but that's something you can just know. Then, the, really what you can do is you could say that any sample, any entire sample of a gas, if it has a volume and a temperature, and if it has multiple components, you can say that the P totals, all, the P total added up is equal to the N totals times your RT over V. So you can basically get one big PV equals NRT, for an entire sample of ideal gases. It works the same way. All you have to do is add up the pressures, add up the moles, put them into the PV equals NRT equation. The R, T, and the V are held constant because they don't change in the, in the container. So um, that, would, that would also work as well. So you could do that with samples. Here's just an example of that. This is Dalton. This is also Dalton. So Dalton's back. Um, he also made laws about gas. He saw Avogadro made laws, and he's like, oh, I'm going to get in on that. More Nobel Prizes for me. So he's like, all right, I'll do my partial pressures law. So it's exactly what it is. If you have pressure one, say pressure one is equal to two, pressure two is equal to four, P total will be equal to six. So that leads us into the mole fraction. Now, I went over that partial pressure quickly because it's fairly easy. Now, mole fraction is very similar to partial pressure. So the ratio of the number of moles in a of a component is kind of the same as the, as the partial pressure. And it's basically the fraction of the moles uh, out of the total moles. So if you can say that, let's go back to this example, that the total moles in here is one, then, or the N total, NT equals one, then N2 would be the same percentage of moles that it is in pressure. So here you have four over six is the, is the percentage. So it's 
two thirds of P2. This mixture is two thirds of P2 based on pressure. That means in terms of the moles, it's gonna be two thirds as well. So your N2 would be 0 0.67 and your N1 would be 0 0.33. So it works, the, the, the ratios are exactly the same. And this is how you calculate the mole fraction for one specific um, component of a mixture. You take the moles of that mixture, divide it by the total moles in, in the mixture and uh, of gases in the mixture, and you get the mole fraction. So then that's just the same thing. So this is saying basically what this is very complicated, basically saying what I just said, taking a bunch of PV equals NRTs and making them equal to the same thing with pressure. So um, the mole fraction is basically equal to the pressure fraction. That's something that's key for ideal gases. Because the idea here is that they're so small and they take up so little space that they're strictly dependent on the volume they take up or the volume that the entire mixture takes up, the, basically the volume of the container and the pressures they're in. And then the number of moles of them is directly proportional to that pressure. Is the same number, the same ratio as that pressure. So basically the important takeaway here is that the mole fraction percentage, so here you'll get a percentage, let's say it's 66%, that is going to equal the same percentage as P1 of that, of let's say it's 66% out of the total pressure. So that'll be the same thing. Those are the key things. That the mole fraction is equal to the pressure fraction in a, in a sample of ideal gases. And there's, here's that perfect. So directly relates to its partial pressure. Okay, then you can rearrange this and you can say the partial pressure of a particular component is the mole fraction multiplied by the total pressure. So this mole fraction, this, this, um, this is like a, this is not an X, it's chi or psi, what is it? It's chi. Yeah, chi is the Greek letter. It's a capital chi. It's been a while since the frat days. So I forgot about that one, but it's, I think it's capital chi. But anyway, so capital chi is the mole fraction. And it's not really just the mole fraction. It's the pressure fraction also, like, like I just said. If you multiply that fraction by the total pressure, you get the partial pressure of one of your components. So some of these questions might ask, might give you, you have one mole of each, of one, you have three components, one mole each. What is the partial pressure of component number one? So you say, all right, there's one mole of each of them. That means the total moles is three. Each one is one third of that. So the mole fraction is one third, the partial pressure is one third, and that's it. So they're both, you get the same numbers really, you get the same ratio, very redundant. All right, so let's do an example. So a partial pressure of oxygen was observed to be 156 torr in air with a total atmospheric pressure of 743. Calculate the mole fraction of O2 present. So we know a bunch of things. We know, that the mole fraction is equal to the pressure fraction. So P O2, or the, the mole fraction of O2 is equal to the pressure fraction of O2 divided by P total. So we can just directly put this in. The partial pressure of O2 was observed to be 156. The total atmospheric pressure is 743. So we can divide those two and get a number, 0 0.21, that would be our mole fraction. So mole fraction equals pressure fraction. Cool, make sense? Cool, any questions online? No, all right. All right, let's do more. All right, so STP is back. So who can remind me, what does STP mean again? Well, yeah, but what is the standard condition? Mm -hmm. Good, perfect. So zero degrees Celsius, one atmosphere. So consider a flask, and we have two answers here. Good job, Lucas, good job. Oh, yeah, Lu yeah, that's good. Yeah, 273 Kelvin, same thing. So 273 Kelvin, same thing. All right, so consider the flask, the STP, containing equal masses of helium, 
oxygen, and hydrogen. So which of the gases will have the partial pressure the greatest? So it has all of them in there. So which one will have the highest partial pressure? We have two answers online. We have D and we have A. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, none of those D and A are not correct. And that's correct, Harrison. You have hydrogen, is that what you said? Yes, so hydrogen is the correct answer. And I'll explain why. Well, because it's right, it's written right here. Duh, no, but um, the reason is, think about this. This flask has equal masses, very similar to the problem from before. Equal masses does not mean equal moles or equal molecules. So the heavier molecules, which the ones that have the heavier molar masses, will have the least amount of moles. So O2 will have a very small amount of moles because it's 32 grams per mole, it's a bigger gas. Helium will be in second place and hydrogen will be in third, which will have two grams per mole. This is 32, this is four. So because this, and this keep in mind, this is one flask, because H2 will have the most moles in that equal mass, then, well, let's just do an example. Let's, let's do 100 grams. Let's say it's 100 grams. H2 in 100 grams will have 50 moles in this sample. Helium at 4 grams per mole in 100 grams will have 25 moles. And O2 will have about 3 moles in 100 grams. So, because the mole fraction is the same thing as the partial pressure fraction, whichever one has the most amount of moles has the highest partial pressure, has the highest mole fraction, et cetera. So that answer would be hydrogen because it has the most moles in the sample. So cool, any questions about that? No? Okay, then H2. Oh, we have a question. Nope. Okay, good job, Lucas. All right. So, uh, next thing we're going to cover is the kinetic molecular theory of gases called the KMT. Now, we've been talking about gases for almost two hours. So, Washington, well, a little over one hour. Seems like two hours. And I think we've already established most of these rules already with um, the kinetic molecular theory. So, basically, what it is, it's a set of postulates. And there's five or six of them. There's five. Um, I don't know why I said five or six. There's either four or five, depending on which textbook you look at, but mostly it's five. That basically tries to explain the properties of an ideal gas. So in this ideal condition, what's true? And you can, it basically just talks about their behavior. And obviously these real gases that we're going to talk about towards the end of class have a different, they don't conform to the ideal gas law the combined gas law, and there's, a, there's some modifications to it. But anyway, here's the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Postulate number one, gases do not attract or repel, meaning they have no interaction between each other. This is not true because we assume this is one of the assumptions. So it's not really that true, but um, it's mostly true. They, they have very, very extremely weak interactions. And the kind of interactions they have are called van der Waals forces, which is, we're gonna learn about that in chapter, I think 12 or 13, towards the end. And basically, um, that means they're very weak nonpolar forces, and they kind of induce a momentary electron displacement, which causes like a weak attraction, a transient interaction, very weak and then it goes by. This is extremely weak. But, and we can just say, ah, well, let's, that's negligible. We'll just say they don't attract the repel at all, which is fine. Two, gas particles are smaller than the spaces between them. Almost all of the volume of a gas is empty space. That's important because no matter what the molar mass is of our gas, no matter how big it is, it doesn't matter. It just matters how many molecules there are. That's what determines their volume, their pressure. Well, not really their volume. This container determines the volume. But um, that determines the pressure, the size of a balloon, whatever, that whatever it may be. It's based on the number of molecules, not necessarily their size, because they're so small compared to the space between them. Gas, third one, gas particles 
are in constant random motion, and it should say constant random straight linear motion. I hate random. It's not random. It's based on the, if you remember that analogy I had the first day of class where every gas around us is hitting another gas particle at very close proximity, maybe a couple centimeters away, and then bouncing off of it, and all the momentum is conserved over the whole span of the atmosphere. And this is not really random motion. It's just constant linear motion and like, like a ping pong kind of thing. Ping pong with billions of gas particles. Next one. Oh, question. Very chaotic, but not random. I like that. Chaotic motion, but not random. Um, four, no kinetic energy is lost when gas particles collide. That is one way of saying that gas particles go through completely elastic collisions. And this is another assumption because there is a small attraction or small repulsion force which changes that energy a little bit, doesn't really conserve the energy as much, but in general, the energy is conserved. So um, no kinetic energy is lost. So it bounces in with the same speed, bounces off with the same speed. Five, all gases have the same average kinetic energy at a given temperature. Now that is just the definition of temperature. So temperature, the definition of temperature is the average kinetic energy of a set of particles. So that one is just stay, stating that at a given temperature, they all have this average speed. And we can say the whole sample has an average speed. Doesn't mean they're all moving at this speed. And we're gonna see that later on. There's actually graphs that I show like this. This is the velocity of different gases. And the ones that are, have a wider span are the ones that are heavier, but I think this one's hydrogen. So with hydrogen gases, the velocity is mostly here. Most of them are around this point, around 500 meters per second. Some of them are here are really, really fast, and, some are, and maybe a couple are really, really slow. But the average of that is, in the, is gonna be the same. So, um, oh, and this is as temperature increases, sorry. But this is just to get you an idea of the average. It's not really the best graph to show, but whatever. Okay, cool. So now we're gonna go on to looking at this in more detail. So here's the pistons that should have been shown for Boyle's law, but what happens is you have a certain pressure and a certain volume. You decrease the volume by increasing the pressure on the piston or increasing the force on the piston, that decreases the volume and that increases the force of the molecules on the inside of the container, which increases the pressure, which we've seen before. Then if you do the opposite, or no, this is, this is different, the effect on temperature. So if you increase the temperature, what's gonna happen, if you hold this volume constant, if you hold that volume fixed, in order to keep that volume fixed, with the temperature increased, the molecules want to move faster and they want to have more force on their container. So in order to counteract that force, you need to increase the pressure you're putting on the piston to keep it in the same spot. So it's like, whoa, they're moving faster now. I got to push harder to keep them in the bucket. So it's the same thing. Now, if you don't hold the piston constant. So if you have the pistons here and you increase the temperature, the volume will increase as well because those pistons want to be more, those pistons, those molecules want to be more free and they're putting more, they're exerting more force in the outside of the, or the inside of the container leading to an increase in volume. So that's what happens when the temperature is increased. And it's just summarizing. Now, if you increase the amount of moles, if you increase the amount of moles, and keep the pressure constant, what's gonna happen is in order to maintain that pressure, the piston's going to expand and the volume is going to increase. And that's what's gonna happen here. If you, that's like if you increase your, um, so when you, let's say you have a, let's say you have a, a completely flat tire, right? There's no holes in it. Let's just say it's flat. If you start putting in air, the pressure will stay constant for a while. You'll notice that the volume will not automatically, or sorry, no, the, um, my bad. Well, 
two things happen. Before the volume increases and before you see the gas, the, the tire start to increase, the volume will be held constant, but the pressure will increase by when you're pumping in more molecules to a point where that pressure can no longer, that pressure force is enough to increase the volume of the heavy rubber. Because rubber is pretty heavy in comparison. It takes a lot of molecules to push it. So once you get enough molecules of gas in your tire, then the pressure is, is going up slowly. It goes up slower. And to compensate for that, since you're pumping in the same amount of gas, the volume starts to increase. And then it reaches a point where the volume stops increasing. And that's when the tire is almost full. But let's say it's at 28 PSI. There's no visual difference between 28 PSI and 35 PSI because it still looks full. But when you increase the amount of gas, the pressure is going to increase, but the volume won't because the rubber is at its maximum capacity of, of increase in volume. If it goes any more, it might break or it's, 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 it would be more of a volume increase in the specifications of that rubber. So in a, a tire is a great example. All, all of this is happening in every stage of filling a flat tire. There's a constant dynamic of changing between temperatures constant, but the volume and pressure and what's changing first based on the constraints of the, of the tire. That's cool. Okay, so temperature, meaning of temperature. Um, so the Kelvin temperature, we know this, is the average kinetic energy of the particles. And we don't really have to worry about this equation. So at oxygen, here's oxygen, here's a, a normal distribution of oxygen velocity at STP. And you can see that most of the molecules are in this range of, in this range of um, velocities, but there are some that are really fast and there's some that are really slow. And sometimes those really fast and slow ones are just maybe on the edge of the container, maybe in the middle, but it's just, it's always a distribution. It's not always every gas molecule is moving the same speed. It's always an average. And if you increase that temperature, that average or that, that gradient becomes more spread out. So that's what the graph, I, I showed the wrong graph before, which is this one. But let's say this is, N, this is N2. And if you have N2 at STP, it looks like this purple one. If you have S, or N2, if you increase the temperature 1,000 Kelvin, 2,000 Kelvin, what happens is that gradient spreads out. And even though the average kinetic energy or the average speed increases, so does the distribution. And the average is around here, but for 2000 degrees, some of them are moving slow and some of them are moving really, really fast. So it increases that chaos. It increases the amount of chaos, but it also uniformly increases the velocity. All right, so let's do this question. So a piston containing a fixed number of moles of N2 is heated. The volume of the gas increases to keep the pressure constant, okay? Let's read that again. So a piston containing a fixed number of moles is heated up, right? So speed increases. Volume is increased, it keeps the pressure constant. Okay. The best explaining of what's happening at the molecular level. N2 molecules have gotten larger and take up more volume. No. I don't like, oh, well, sorry, I gave you the answer, but I don't like that answer. Um, to, uh, B. N2 molecules are moving faster and colliding with the size of the container with more force. Or C, N2 molecules have gotten smaller, are moving faster, and are colliding with the size of the container with more force. Which one? B, yes. So the molecules don't get bigger or smaller. Um, so that's, they could have picked better wrong answers, but whatever. So obviously it's not those, and it's B. So the end, so in this case where you're having the it's heated, the molecules move faster. The volume's increasing because the molecules are moving faster, putting more pressure on the outside container. In order to keep the pressure constant, they must, um, the volume must increase to relieve that pressure. Something went wrong. Sorry. 
All right. Um, this is a good one. So consider three flasks, one liter each at STP. Flask A contains helium. Flask B contains oxygen. And flask C contains hydrogen. So these three gases again. In which of the gases do the, in which of the flasks do the gas particles so which of them will have the highest velocity? The hydrogen, because hydrogen is gonna be smaller and smaller means faster. The bigger ones move slower, but on average, they move the same energy, not speed. Yeah, so I think I messed that up. I'm, I'm like exhausted. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody online, is there any questions about that? I'll say it one more time, because I think I messed it up. I, I taught an 8 a.m. class, now this is, now this is 8 p.m. So like I've been doing work all day, but no excuses. Um, so basically, kinetic energy is a function of mass and volume. If you have slower gases, that means they're going to be heavier. Heavier gases move slower. Big trucks move fast, move slower than little race cars. Same thing. So the kinetic energy will be the same for all of them because it's a function of mass and volume. When you talk about velocity, velocity won't be the same for all of them. The smaller ones will move faster. And that's true for gas. So that's why hydrogen will move the fastest. Okay, so let's do another one. So four identical flasks. This time you have four flasks with helium, chlorine gas, methane, and ammonia. So which of them have the highest average velocity? Good, helium. So helium's gonna have the highest average velocity because helium is the lightest and the smallest. Chlorine has a mass of like 70. This is 16 and this is 17. And then helium's four. So helium will be the fastest. Good. Okay, so one of the last things we're gonna learn is diffusion and effusion. So very basically, we're gonna learn about it. So in very basic terms. So diffusion is the mixing of gases. So if you have, all right, like we'll use an elementary example. If you fart, right, that gas is diffusing into the atmosphere. So it's basically the introduction of one gas into another. Or let's say you have two chambers of gas and one and you lift a wall and the other one integrates with the other one. That's diffusion of gases. And the rate of diffusion is how fast they mix. And there's equations to govern that. Effusion, is the passage of this gas through a tiny orifice into an evacuated chamber. So it's kind of being pushed along. I mean, effusion is kind of like a fart too, but it's like, I'm talking about like a very small orifice, like, like um, the diameter of like a couple atoms thick, right? It's not gonna be anything that we can see, right? So um, the rate of effusion measures the speed at which the gas one is going through the hole into the second chamber. And this actually, so here's what a fusion looks like. It's a little pinhole that you can see it's, it's on the order of scale of the size of the atom of the gas molecule. So it's pretty small. And there is a way to measure this. So diffusion, we're not gonna learn about the gas diffusion equations. That gets really complicated. Um, but effusion, here is a relationship to know. And this will be given on the exam. And Maybe you didn't notice this, but it already was given on the first exam. There was on the top, there was some constants and some equations, and this was one of them. But we didn't need to know it for the first exam. So what it says is the rate of effusion for gas one over the rate of effusion for gas two equals the square root of the molar mass of mass of uh, gas two over the square root of the molar mass of gas one. So what does this mean? This means that, let's say, gas one is oxygen, gas two is hydrogen. And we can do an example. So let's calculate this for oxygen and hydrogen. Gas one is oxygen. So the rate of effusion by this equation would be the square root of the molar mass of gas two, which is hydrogen, so the molar mass of that is two, divided by the molar mass of gas one. Gas one is going to be oxygen, which is 32. 
So you have the square root of two over that. You have square root of two and square root of 16. So that's one over four. So this would basically be the square root of two times the square root of 16. Square root of twos will cancel out. Square root of one over square root of 16 is one over four. I think I know algebra. So you get that. What does this mean? Now this means the numerators, even though, so it's an inverse, it's flipped. This means that for every four molecules of gas two, four molecules of gas two, one molecule of O2, or I'm sorry, of gas one goes through. So that's what this means. And based on their sizes and their speeds, that makes sense because gas two is hydrogen. So for every four molecules of gas two that effuse through a little hole, only one of gas one, which is oxygen, which is bigger, will go through. So this is what you can determine from the rate of effusion. The questions might be difficult, but it's important to interpret this equation. The questions might ask really something like this. If you have neon and argon gas, what will be the rate of effusion or how many particles of neon gas will go through, will effuse when 70 argon gas molecules will effuse, effuse. So you'd have to do this equation with both of them and make, it doesn't matter which one you set one or two and you get that ratio. And that ratio directly tells you, all right, the rate of gas one is one, meaning one molecule per second, let's say. The rate of two is two molecules per second. And keep in mind, this is a rate. So it's not one molecule per four molecules, like I just said. It's one molecule per second compared to four molecules per second. So another thing they might ask you is, how many seconds would it take? That's more of an advanced question, but I think there's one on the homework like that. But if it's, uh, at least for the homework for 125, there's one. But if it's like that, so this is one, I'll say molecule per second, molecule per second. So it would say, how many seconds would it take, I don't know, 20 molecules of gas two to go through and it would be five, but then you can, there could be some other question where we could compare that to the number of molecules of gas one that go through. But anyway, just, it's important to view this as a second, as a rate. So it's per amount of time. It doesn't have to be seconds, but it's just per an amount of time. So, so yeah. Other than that, the equation is not too difficult. Just interpreting it is, you have to do it slow. Any questions on that? No? All right, moving on. So we'll do this one. Yeah. Calculate the ratio of effusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride, a gas used to enrichment of nuclear reactors. Okay, so we'll do the rate of one over the rate of two equals the square root of the molar mass of two over the square root of the molar mass of one. So hydrogen gas we'll call one. So one, we'll put, um, we'll put R1 equals H2, R2 equals UF6. So now the molar masses. So the molar mass of UF6 Uranium is big, so let's see. UF6 molar mass is 352. 352. The molar mass of hydrogen is two. So you do this equation, and what, do you, what number do you get? You get 13.2. So it's telling you that for every 13.2 molecules of H2 that go through, only one molecule of UF6 goes through. So the effusion rate for light hydrogen is 13 times more than the massive UF6. That's what you can say about that. Okay, cool. So, okay, we get it, ideal gas behavior. So the last thing we're gonna go over is what if the gases, or when aren't the gases ideal? So this ideal gas approach is hypothetical. And it, it's the closest to the truth when you're at atmospheric conditions, normal living conditions. Let's say 
ATMs are below 20, below 10 even. Once you get to an extremely high pressure, ideal gas behavior goes crazy, goes out of whack. Same thing with temperature. If you go to crazy high temperatures, out of whack. So how do we, well, first I'm going to show you a graph of how true this is. Now here's pressure. So here's PV equals NRT for one mole of an ideal gas. So it's basically saying that one mole, like at zero ATM, one ATM, it's very low. It's like over here. Once you get to over like five to 10 ATM, these graphs go nuts. Meanwhile, the ideal gas behavior should be here, should be 1.0 the whole time. But once you get to 200 ATM, which is insane, we'd be, we would be pancakes. Um, all the, the behavior goes nuts. So it's only good, very, very low ATM, one or two or three. So anything more than 10, it kind of goes crazy, honestly. But um, is that 200 kelvins? And with temperature, it changes more if you increase the temperature. So yeah, um, here is plot of people's NRT versus, and here's, so here's what I mean by temperature. So in this case, you have nitrogen at three different temperatures at three different lines and the pressure is increasing like crazy. So if you, well, actually in this case, if you, for nitrogen's case, if you increase the temperature, it actually gets closer to ideal gas. But I guess because it compensates for the pressure increase, but still, it, it's still crazy. But anyway, so ideal gas behavior would be good for like maybe that range, but anything above the, anything with the crazy, the pressure is really dictated a lot. So, um, just keep that in mind. Now, how can we accommodate this into our equations? There's two ways we can do this. And these, are, these two ways are called corrective factors. Now, you might have a question, maybe one question on this on the exam or on your homework, but these corrective factors are represented in the Van der Waals equation. So we'll learn about Van der Waals later on in, in chapter 11 or 12. And I did mention that already, Van der Waals forces. He, he invests something else, he, something independent of this. But basically, uh, this scientist Van der Waals, he came up with a correction or a modification of the ideal gas law, which modified two things. It modified the pressure and it modified the volume based on a different, uh, basically a corrective value based on what how much gas there was and some kind of constant for each gas. And for the volume, this is the correction he made. V was V before, now V equals V minus NB. For N is the number of moles of gas, and B is an empirical constant based on um, whatever gas it is. So that's one modification, and, uh, and it'll be shown right here. So here's what the ideal gas law would look like with that modification. Instead of V, you have or it would be P, if you want to keep the Pivnert notation, it would be P times V minus NB equals NRT, like that. This is the, just the modification. And also, you don't have to write this one yet. You can write the main one. So there's another correction. The second correction is for pressure. So pressure correction is now P was now P minus some constant A, that's proportionality constant for whatever gas you're talking about, times the moles of that gas divided by the volume squared. This does not have to be memorized, so don't, don't, be, don't go crazy. But basically, if you put those two corrective factors into the ideal gas law, you get this. So this is the new ideal gas law, where PV is now P plus A n over v squared times the new corrected v, which is v minus nb, equals nrt. So this is the van der Waals equation. And a and b are determined by whatever gas you're looking at. And since we saw those graphs before, and every gas doesn't have the same exact ideal gas behavior at higher pressures and temperatures, then that's where we use these a and b values to get more correct answer. So I'll let you write that. And then we'll look at the A and B values. Okay. 
interesting. All right. So here's, here's some ideas of some A and B values for different gases. So you have helium, neon. I mean, they just, some of them, they, they go up, they go down, whatever. It's, it's just the constants for them. And they have units as well that are proportional to the constants. So yeah, um, that's basically it for the chapter, honestly. So what time is it, 813? Yeah, so any questions on this or any anything we learned about gases? I know towards the end, we were just like throwing around topics, but uh, I'm gonna end the video. Stop the recording.